Happy New Year and welcome back to PAC TV Community News. I'm Julie Thompson and I'm here with Zach Dolan. We're excited to be bringing you back to local stories from the South Shore. We have a very full show this week and we take you to a winery in Pembroke, a public forum on the Cape Cod Canal bridges and a tick collection site in Millborough. PCM boards a dredging barge in Plymouth Harbor and we find out what the big news is that Plymouth 400 and Pilgrim Hall Museum announced at the Forefathers Luncheon. We head to Habermock Elementary in Pembroke as they took on a shark tank challenge and we bring the president of the Plymouth Education Foundation to the set to learn more about their upcoming events. It's going to be a great show but we begin in Plymouth Harbor. If you've ever been to the Plymouth Harbor waterfront these past few months, you likely have seen the very large barges in the harbor. This is the dredging project of Plymouth Harbor. Last dredged in the 1960s, the Army Corps' two-year project plans to be completed in the spring of 2020. We caught up with Plymouth's harbor master to take a tour of the project and see what working on a dredging barge is like. Watching is the uh, Burnham dredge, and they're um, they're dredging Plymouth Harbor. This is part of the Army Corps project, uh, which has actually spanned over two years. So they have um, two seasons, two dredge seasons, where they'll complete this project. It's close to about 400,000 cubic yards of material being removed, uh, and basically we're restoring the depth of the channel uh, to 15 feet and the mooring field uh, to 8 feet at low tide. Uh, this will allow the passage for uh, deeper draft vessels, uh, tall ships, cruise ships, uh, smaller end cruise ships. You know, they inquire about coming to Plymouth because we have a lot to offer here in the community. Um, and right when we start talking about having the concerns about the depth of the vessel, uh, they, they don't want to run aground. So they just go right by. So obviously this is, uh, timing of this is, in preparation for the 2020 celebration. Um, the timing that we have, they'll be dredging the two seasons, so they'll be finishing up the spring of 2020, um, which again, uh, one, of the, one of the big uh, events for 2020 is the Maritime Salute event, which is scheduled for the end of June. So we'll be fully dredged um, and ready to go for that event. Uh, so they can dredge from October 1st to January 15th each year. Um, so they've obviously, they got on site this year a little later, this, towards the end of October. They'll be here till January 15th. They'll break down, everything will be removed. Uh, we'll have summer and then they'll come back next October 1st. Um, in preparation for next year, they'll be uh, completing the anchorage part. Um, we have about 400 moorings to remove prior to them dredging. So what we'll do is uh, we're working on um, a mooring plan. Uh, right now the moorings are just sort of set, um, not really in a grid, it's not an organized grid, uh, but it's sort of worked over the years. But with everything coming out, we're starting clean slate. Uh, we'll have a mooring plan and we'll have a very defined layout for the boats going back. Having learned more about the reasons behind the dredging and the benefits of it, we hopped onto one of the rigs to learn more about the typical day the dredge workers go through. My day uh, consists of coming to work at about 6 o'clock in the morning, and we're presently located in the God Box, the control tower of the, uh, for this dredge, uh, where I have a computer screen that observes what the crane is doing pulls information in and lets us know exactly where we are and exactly what we have to, where we have to dig. The crane operator, Tom Desmond, who sits there masterfully, takes clumps of mud with the environmentally friendly bucket and loads a barge called a dump scow. Um, so we take uh, 10 foot steps, advances, and we do a set of uh, digging the mud and loading the barge and then when the barge is loaded we send it off to sea and we wait for another barge and we load that. It takes it about four hours to fill each barge. It also depends on how much material is in front of the bucket. Ted then took us through some of the charts and maps that were in the control room or God box of the dredging rig and explained the importance behind each one. The colors everything that I've done already and I just you know, it's my daily art class. 
Now the crane operator also sees, has a screen in the crane where you see all the marks, the bucket marks. When Tom's done with the a certain spot, he will stamp it and then he'll move on to the next spot. Though it may seem like a straightforward process, each individual harbor that is dredged presents its own challenges that the workers must take into consideration. Every harbor is different. The, uh, the, the winds, the currents, uh, weather conditions. Here we're pretty much exposed to a, a fairly large open bay. We do have a breakwater, but that's primarily for storm activity. With such a large operation happening in a popular location like Plymouth, it is natural that local residents that use the harbor would be concerned about how it is going to affect the use of their boats that they keep there. What we're doing, uh, we've been in close communication with uh, the mooring holders, uh, keeping them aware of what's happening. Everybody seems to be very excited about the dredge. Uh, there's a, a little concern about everything sort of coming out and going back in, uh, which is to be understood. Uh, but I think uh, at the end of the day, when we have the finished product, there's water under everybody's boat. Um, there's a very nice layout for the mooring, so it's much easier to wave fine through the mooring field. Uh, I think everybody will be quite happy. Most people are used to a construction project where you can see progress. Uh, in this case, everything's happening under the surface of the water, so you really can't see that sort of progress. Uh, we have a Twitter account that we use, and we've been posting updates there. We also have a dredge uh, page on our Harbormaster Town of Plymouth uh, website uh, trying to keep people uh, up to date with what's happening. Um, but really where this is all going to show off is in, on the 400th celebration uh, when we can bring in tall ships. Um, so really I guess you know you, the dredging's happening now. You won't see that sort of progress but um, the final program when we have the Maritime Festival here in Plymouth for the 400 celebration and we have a, a ton of tall ships, large tall ships in here. Uh, that's really where we're going to show off the project. Wow. I don't even know what to say. That's was so much information in that that people and I think the most important thing he said was you can't really see it. What they're exactly. doing, you see about what's above the water. But tell me what the m most important things that you learned when you went out. Well, I mean, we knew going into that story, it was going to be a very important story because it's a huge project that's going on, and for a lot of people that use that harbor for their boats. But we really. It, all the information was important because we didn't even know going in if we were going to get any of that information. Right. Because we didn't know how if they were going to allow us onto the barges, how close they were going to allow us. But they were. You got up and they were so welcoming. They were. They were. Come on on. Yeah, we you wore your hard tell hat. You, you got to you go need to know everywhere. And, so the public can know. Yeah, so, and I love the fact that they have a Twitter and that they have on the Harbor Masters section of the website. They have updates um, for people to find out. Great story. Thank you. And we're looking forward to continuing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. going to be it's going to be an ongoing process for absolutely. a few years, so we'll definitely keep updated on it. Great. Thank you. Blake Dinius, entomologist educator of Plymouth County Extension, is working in conjunction with Dr. Stephen Rich of Medical Zoology in UMass Amherst. They will be collaborating with people from around the state to collect specimens of ticks. They will analyze them for research on tick-borne diseases like Lyme, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis, and how the diseases are spreading across the region. We caught up with the collection site at Reedy's Archery in Middleborough to learn more. My name is Blake Dinius, and I'm with Plymouth County Extension. I work as the entomologist educator for the county. There's a lot of misinformation that's floating around nowadays, so being able to act as someone who can weed through all of that misinformation and give people the correct knowledge, that's really the primary role of this job. And I, I really like it. <laughs> One more down. We're at Reedy's Archery in Middleborough, and this is just one of a few check-in stations, essentially in every county throughout Massachusetts, that UMS Amherst has requested that people kind of stop by and collect ticks off the deer coming in. We're doing two things. We're going to be collecting the engorged female ticks because they'll be used to replenish the colonies that they have on site. 
and we're also collecting any other ticks uh, for a method of surveillance. So some of the things that we're looking for are Lone Star Tick, which we haven't seen in Plymouth County yet. And we're also looking for potentially the Asian Longhorn Tick, which we know has been seen in neighboring states like Connecticut and New York. Right now, uh, as much research as we can conduct is, is going to help us learn more about fighting the diseases that are out there and protecting ourselves against ticks and the diseases that they carry and transmit to people. But what a lot of people don't realize is that we see Lyme disease cases year round. And so this particular time of year, it's really important to do things like wear long pants, you know, closed toed shoes, uh, that kind of thing, because the adults, as we mentioned, are gonna be seeking out the blood of a large mammal and wear large mammals as well that they can, would easily want to cling to. Can't forget tick checks on your pets and wearing tick protection on your pets year round. Sometimes people say, I, you know, I don't want to treat my dog for ticks and fleas now, it's, it's the winter, but it's a really good time to do it this time of year too. If you find a tick that's embedded in feeding, what you want to do is you want to take the tweezers and you want to press them up against your skin and you want to pull straight up with steady force. Uh, but it's just slow and steady pressure, don't yank, don't twist. I know you want to get that out as quick as possible, but you don't, you want to keep that tick intact. Uh, and after you do that, you can send it out to the UMass Amherst Laboratory of Medical Zoology, the same place that we're conducting this research at, and they'll test that tick for you and they'll tell you exactly what diseases are in it. And one of the reasons to do that is for, you know, peace of mind, if it comes back with no diseases, that's kind of nice to know or a co-infection, what else is in that tick? Is it, is it Lyme, just Lyme, or is it Lyme and babesiosis? You know, you might want to know about that. Uh, and the third reason, which is kind of more of an unselfish reason, is that that knowledge, that, that information that they're collecting from that tick is going to then contribute towards this level, this research, this passive surveillance that they're collecting at UMass Amherst as well. So you're contributing to the scientific community as well by doing something like that. Fifth grade students at Habamock Elementary School participated in a Shark Tank Challenge. Students had to think of a problem in their own lives, invent a product, and present it to the sharks. PCN dropped by to learn more. So I like kids to follow their passion and to bring together um, the things that we're learning into school um, into like real life situations. Last month, the fifth grade students at Habamock Elementary School presented their Shark Tank Challenge projects. Students had to think of a problem in their lives and then develop, market, and sell a product they created to the guest investor sharks. The kids are very motivated. They really found problems that were in their own lives and then tried to find solutions and ways to make life better and easier for people. They're very comfortable in the classroom working on the projects and we're seeing what their ideas are and we're helping them develop it but then to just see the excitement they have on the day that we actually present and um, really see them become, um, you know, a different person than what they are in the classroom in front of the audience. I think that's great. Students came up with things like the unsoggy doggy, an umbrella that a dog can wear to stay dry, and the hear moth, a set of headphones built into earmuffs for athletes who need to stay warm but want to listen to music. It is like headphones, but they're also earmuffs, so you can get them in Bluetooth or not, and also heated or not. So at first I thought that it was going to be like a hard project and that it would be hard to figure something out, but then like when I got through it, I thought that it was easier. We've invited many people throughout the Pembroke uh, community to come in and actually be sharks to get them involved. Anyone that we can get our hands on that would be willing to come and be a shark and be involved, and the kids really get excited to see these other people that they'll eventually get to, to know in, in Pembroke. We hope that they learn more about themselves and you know overcome fear of being nervous in front of an audience, fear of speaking in front of someone and that goes way beyond the curriculum that we teach them. Hearing from parents that they're working on it at home when they don't have to and calling each other and just to see that excitement and their creativity um, that's what I love about it because it gets them really thinking and I think in a way that they don't always see in themselves that they can do this and when they do it they're like this was awesome it, and this is my favorite thing. Getting them to really be able to take that dream and those ideas and see it become something much bigger than they ever thought it could be. I think that's the best part. Like one of the kids said taking something small like a small idea and seeing it come to life. I think that that piece of it for me is the most exciting. Reporting in Pembroke for PAC-TV Community News, I'm Walter Cicchetti. 
The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers New England is conducting a multi-year major rehabilitation evaluation study of the Bourne and Sagamore Highway bridges to determine whether major rehabilitation or replacement of either or both bridges will provide the most reliable and fiscally responsible solution for the future. They held several public meetings to gather input from surrounding towns. PCN stopped into Plymouth South High School's event to learn more about the project. This public meeting is one of five public information meetings for the public to come out and get an overview of the canal bridge study. The way these meetings are set up is they're information meetings. So prior to the meeting, we have an open house. We'll have the subject matter experts available to talk about environmental, engineering, structural, things like that that may interest the people. With poster boards that describe the status of the study right now, and so people can talk to the subject matter experts uh, that are here. And then at 6.30, we'll start the presentation, which will be an overview of the major rehabilitation evaluation study. Really evaluate uh, existing and future conditions, identify deficiencies, uh, and safety and congestion. Now, the bridges are getting kind of old, the Sagamore and Bourne Highway bridges. They're about 83 years old. We continue to maintain them, so they're in good shape as far as, as we're concerned. The problem is it just it gets more and more expensive because uh, we have to repair them more and more frequently as they age. And then we're facing um, the possibility of major rehabilitation in about five years. That's where we have to do major structural uh, engineering. So this study is looking at what's, you know, what's the smartest thing to do? What, what, do, what do we need to do? We want the public to be involved. We're also coordinating with the various state, local, and federal agencies and, and the stakeholders and get, uh, trying to get them involved as well. As the study goes along, uh, we're going to look at other alternatives that may uh, be provided or uh, maybe issues, say, uh, traffic, environmental, noise, pollution, things like that. Uh, the public has an opportunity to provide uh, their concerns, their issues, and that will be something that we'll look at in the environmental assessment. They can also visit the website at www.capecodcanalbridges.com study.com. They can also go to that site to get more information and to provide comments. Well, right now we're looking at a draft, MRER, being available uh, in the summer of two 2019, and the draft environmental assessment being available at that time. So we anticipate we'd have more public meetings at that time to let the, pu the public know what the status is at that point. And then we anticipate that the final will be completed in the winter of 2019-2020. After enrolling in Boston University's winemaking class, Jacqueline Groper decided to start her own winery. The process began in 2016 with the official opening of their tasting room in Pembroke's Industrial Park in July of 2018. She even now hosts a Boston University winemaking class at her winery, and PCN caught up with them on tasting day. I decided to become a, a winemaker and, and start my own winery um, based on a number of factors. Uh, travel has always been an important part of my life and uh, traveling to various parts of, of the world and, and experiencing different wine regions, uh, learning about different grape varieties and um, speaking with winemakers uh, about their philosophy and how they're making wine. You're learning about different countries, whether it's their history, whether it's geology, a topography. Um, you're also learning about science. Uh, you're learning about weather, because weather is a huge important factor in, in um, you know, the, the vines and you know, the grapes that are produced in each season. They can be so, it can be so variable based on the weather. I love the science behind it. I love the art behind it. And I found it, the whole process just fascinating. We host the Boston University winemaking class. You know, we'll talk about the theoretical uh, aspects of winemaking, but as soon as we receive the grapes, everything becomes hands-on. So from sorting the grapes to destemming the grapes, um, uh, fermentation, pressing the grapes, racking the grapes, or transferring the wines, transferring the wines actually into barrel, um, the entire process the students can be part of. And um, it really gives them a, a good understanding of winemaking and how uh, precise it is, how difficult it can be, 
and um, how challenging. The extract, a lot of the color comes from the seeds. What, what was really important for them to understand was tasting each variety on its own and then understanding once you blend them together how they're going to meld. How is this acidity going to stand out in the blended wine? Or how is the mouthfeel going to be? Is, is one of the blends going to be more tannic than the other? And it's all based on the percentages of the varieties you're putting together. One of our philosophies is to incorporate local fruit as best we can. Um, the reason why we chose Pembroke is, is because we you know, live here on the South Shore and we wanted to really make good uh, premium wines here at home. For instance, our 2016 Chardonnay was sourced uh, from uh, the North Fork of Long Island. Uh, we sourced some Chardonnay grapes this year from Greenvale Vineyards in Rhode Island. I'm really excited about how we're received, uh, how people have welcome, welcomed us into the community. We just, we just like to incorporate what we've learned and what we've experienced into what we're doing here in Pembroke and uh, to be able to do something that I absolutely love. The Pilgrim Society, Pilgrim Hall Museum, and Plymouth 400 announced a permanent quadricentennial legacy park project commemorating the 400th anniversary of Plymouth. The conceptual design was announced at the Forefathers Luncheon and included a park area that will be developed on Coles Hill. PCM was there to get the details. Today we are here at the uh, Forefathers Day uh, Luncheon and we just did a presentation for a very exciting new project that we're doing, Plymouth 400 is doing in cooperation with Pilgrim Hall Museum and the Pilgrim Society to create a quadricentennial park commemorating the 400th anniversary. We are working together with, Plym with the Pilgrim uh, Society and with the Horsley Witten group who is doing the design and concept for this park and we are working towards making this an interpretive space on the waterfront from which uh, many, many different things can be interpreted that currently are not interpreted inside the museum. The Pilgrim Society has a very long history of having a presence on the historic waterfront. We once owned all of Coles Hill and Pilgrim Wharf and Plymouth Rock, and we donated those properties to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to be public parks for the people. We've got one little small lot left, and we would like to utilize that uh, for the museum to continue its educational mission and find new ways to share the story of Plymouth's a uh, very interesting and diverse history with as many people as possible. The opportunity to observe and reflect on four centuries of American experience doesn't happen in many communities here in America. Here in Plymouth we have that opportunity and we're really excited about doing something uh, to observe this important moment in our own history um, and to do something lasting that people in future generations can engage. Horsley Witten Group has been involved since a little over a year ago. We've been working with uh, Plymouth 400 on creating conceptual design for this park that they can bring to the Pilgrim Hall Museum uh, with the idea that this space can be used as part of the commemoration uh, in 2020 of the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrim's Landing. The design of this park is especially unique because of uh, that it's this outdoor museum space. It's significant um, historically, uh, but that we're involved with this group of people in creating this outdoor museum that's an extension of the Pilgrim Hall Museum so that it's not only a neighborhood park, it's also that, it's, and it's also just a place where tourists or people can come and use the park um, as other park users would, but it's also this place where they can look at the details, um, look at the materials used on site, and really learn about some of these layers of history that are embedded in the site itself, in the views, um, in the, the design materials, um, and in the stories told. 
We are so pleased to have on set today Bob Betters, who is the president of the Plymouth Education Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Nice to have you here. There's so much about the Plymouth Ed Foundation that is fascinating and wonderful. Yeah, nice so to know. for people that don't know a little bit about it, it was founded in 2008. It was. It's a 501c3, so yes. it's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the foundation is to do what? The purpose of the foundation primarily is to uh, fund student endeavors that uh, are not reliant on tax-based revenue. So okay. we're looking for programs particularly that are different, that are unique, that supplement um, classroom-based. Yep, learning in any, in any way. Learning. Exactly. And is this available, are the grants and the, and the um, monies that you give for the different programs, are they available in the K through 12? Or yes. is there a certain, it is. Yes. So it's around the gamut. Yes, it is. Okay, does, do mostly students come up with the ideas of what they want, or do the teachers, or is it a combo? Uh, well, I think it's, it, I think it's primarily teachers and administrators who submit the grant applications. We have had some from students mm -hmm. um, wanting to go to different programs or for travel or that type of thing. And we yep. have funded some of those, but prim but primarily it's applications that are submitted by teachers and administrators. Okay. And 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 anything that we get in terms of an application submitted by a teacher has to be signed off by the the relevant administrator. Sure. So we try to make sure that it's coordinated with what the school department is doing. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about grants in a minute, but you all also give scholarships. We do. So talk about that. The, w right now, this year, we're providing four Plymouth Education Foundation scholarships, each in the amount of $2,500, two for Plymouth North and two for Plymouth South. Which is really, that's a nice amount. It, it, it is. That's a nice amount. We've increased it over the years. Last year and years before, it was 2000 but we've increased it to $2,500 yeah. per scholarship this year. We also administer funds that came from Adele Manfredi's parents. Um, okay, and that was a Dr. separate Mrs. scholarship Adele. fund? That was yep. a scholarship fund that they had created some years ago mm -hmm. that Adele was uh, managing. Mm -hmm. And then when we created the Education Foundation, she transferred those funds to us to manage. And that's $1,000 a year that alternates between a Plymouth North and a Plymouth South student. Great. And uh, how many, approximately how many applications do you get for those $2,500 scholarships each year? We don't get involved in the application process. Okay. We, allow, we, we, we leave that to the scholarship committee for gotcha. the school department. Okay. So they basically vet the students. Yep. They determine who should be the recipients, and we cut the checks. And you provide the checks for right. it. Okay. Um, now, to date, you've given over $100,000 in grants. Grants and scholarships. And scholarships. Yes. To the students and the faculty of the, the Plymouth School System, yes. which is amazing. Yeah. You have an endowment which exceeds $800,000 at this point. Some people don't understand what an endowment is, so can you talk about that, how it's funded and, and what the purpose is? So when, when we created the Education Foundation more than 10 years ago, mm -hmm. the goal was to do two things. The goal was to create an endowment, which is a fund um, for which the principal is not used. Okay. So that it's the, the fund is designed to generate income mm -hmm. that's, that's then used for educational purposes. So we wanted the Education Foundation to be permanent. We exactly. wanted it to have a long-lasting effect. Yep. The way to do that is to grow the endowment so that the principal remains untouched. It's right. invested and yeah. the income, assuming funds ever generate income right. again. Right, assuming um, the stock market doesn't <laughs> completely tank. <laughs> exactly, yeah. you know, to, to use it. So that was that was one of our primary goals. Yeah. And we, we, we try to set aside 50% of the funds that we raise for the endowment. Oh, wow. Um, and, and But we also wanted to make a difference right away. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to just hold on to right, the funds. Right. So we wanted to create an immediate impact. So mm -hmm. the other 50% we use, some for administrative expenses, but um, at least 40% of what we generate we use for grants and for scholarships. For grants and scholarships. Can you give me, um, now I know we talked before um, we went on the air about some of the different types of um, activities or subjects that were covered in, in your grants. And they include playgrounds and music, robotics, um, sustainable agriculture, iPod grants for math. So your grants really cover the gamut. They do. As I indicated, we try to look at things that are different and yeah. unique and that are going to make a difference. I mean, we look at education as a multifaceted process. It's not just classroom and learning, et cetera. Right obviously extremely important, right. but also experience and also being involved in the community right. and also doing things that, you know, students have a, have, um, a desire to do, right. you know, kind of independent of, right. of kind of classroom activities. So it, we looked at things that are different and unique and, and um, we've, 
been surprised at the gamut of applications yeah. that we have. Some have been, you know, very unique. Yeah. Sustainable agriculture, yeah. you know, type That's grants different. and that yeah. type of thing. We've done a lot for playground renovations, yeah. for example. Oh, perfect. And we've also partnered with other uh, foundations in the area um, in educational activities. Uh, you know, I mentioned Chamber of Commerce Chamber. has yep. the Jumpstart program. Um, that we've donated to an, uh, over a number of years that, that essentially provides funds for certificate programs at community colleges. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, again, to provide alternatives to sure. um, so college it, or community college. It's all about college. lifting up the it, students. Yeah, exactly. At whatever point they, they're yeah. in, in their careers. And, and that, the so that's great. Um, yeah. The Plymouth Philharmonic we've done yeah. grants with yeah. for music programs yeah. for students, Pilgrim Hall Museum. Right. Um, and then we provided an initial grant early on when we started to the library for adult literacy. All, so, all wonderful things. So even though we've, we're focusing primarily on students and school endeavors, public school endeavors, right. et cetera, we also look at yep. partnering with other we're connected. foundations. We're all connected, which yeah. especially in this in this yeah. community. Okay, now the um, Adele Manfredi Award is given out each year. Yes. And that is an award that's based on Adele, who was someone who was very, very um, involved in the Plymouth School System. It, and she was very involved in our foundation. Yep. She was one of the founding members. Um, so she was involved right at the get-go. And so a lot of the organization that we've done, a lot of the mission mm -hmm. and, and vision that we had was Adele's. And when Adele passed away, we decided the best way to honor her would be to provide this award, yeah. which, which we uh, present um, annually at our gala. So okay. that's one of the things that and, we do at our Valentine's Day. And this gala. year it's going to go to um, the family of Dick Silva, who it unfortunately is. passed away this past May. And you can read about him on your website. It yes. gives a kind of a background of why you're giving it to him, and it's really, um, it's touching and it's moving. Now let's talk in, the, in our last minute about the Valentine Gala, because this is your big fundraiser. It, it is. This is our ninth annual gala, yeah. and that is our primary fundraiser. This year it is Saturday, February 9th. Uh, at Waverly Oaks. Yep. We, we've kind of changed the venue over the years. Okay. This year it's going to be um, at Waverly, yeah. 6 to 11. Yeah. Reservations, we don't have tickets per se, yep. but reservations, reservations can be made on and our it's website. it's kind of swanky, right? Well, it's black tie optional. Well, you but, want that. But, that's fun. You know, we, that's kind of one of the things that we decided to, to to have it black tie yeah, optional. It, it raises the level. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, and, and actually this year is kind of different. The last, for the, for the first eight uh, galas, we focused a lot on live and silent auctions. Yep. We're not doing that this year. Oh. We're focusing more on a community celebration and more on scholarships and donations yeah. ahead of time. You know, rather than having people think about writing checks right. or bidding, right. you know, so it, we have the Fay Band mm -hmm. to provide yeah, um, which is nice. live, know, music, the, live, live music, dancing, yeah. etc. So we're focusing on, again, a community celebration, okay. less on the fundraising, but we're encouraging people to, to provide sponsorships sure. and donations sure. ahead of time, which they can do on the website. Right, and it's uh, Plymouth Foundation, PlymouthEducationFoundation.org? Dot org. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. This went like that. My pleasure. Um, it was great to have you and great to find out about the Plymouth Education Foundation. Great thank to be you, here. Thank you. And thank you for watching. PCN is on Facebook and Twitter, so be sure to follow us there. For more information and links to our stories, check out PCN at www.pactv.org. We're back in two weeks with more local stories from your community. Have a great week.